Welcome to Module 7 on Mining Data Streams. There are four main learning objectives for this module. The first is to explain the difficulties that arise when you try and calculate exact statistics from a stream. The second is to be able to calculate the average numeric value from a stream of numbers. Uh, so what do we need to do to change our equations for means when we're dealing with streams? Then we'll talk about using hashing to apply filtering to streams when the number of keys that we care about could be much larger than what we can fit in memory, uh, let alone the potentially unbounded size of the stream. And then finally, we'll talk about methods for sampling, and you should be able to identify or describe at least one of these sampling methods, uh, either from sampling for a fixed proportion of elements, say 10% of the stream, or a fixed number, say 10 elements from a stream. So let's set up a motivating example here. Imagine you're provided with an uh, infinite stream of data, say packet sizes, that's given to you by some firewall. And you want to calculate some statistics over the packet size of this stream. And to do so, you get some data that's timestamped down to the second. And maybe you want to calculate the average packet size for the 100 most recent connections in the log. So you can have some window that only uh, covers the 100 most recent connections and pages out or drops off or expires uh, content outside of that. So you want to instead calculate the average packet size for the most recent 10 minutes of data. So then you can do some wall clock thing to, you know, make tr uh, to keep track of how many bytes of uh, each packet is that you've seen in the past 10 minutes and sort of page things out. Maybe you want to calculate the average packet size across the entire data stream. So now you can't deal with this just using Windows. You have to potentially store the entire packet size, or rather the entire data stream of packet sizes, or come up with some more, more uh, reasonable way of doing it without having to store the entire stream. Now let's make this a little bit more complicated and say not only do you want to calculate some average packet size, but you want to do so for each IP address. You want to understand, well, what's the average number of bytes being sent and received from a particular system, rather than across all systems that engage with my web server or engage with my firewall. Now that we've gone from some single statistic for your, your server to many statistics for all possible IP addresses that may engage with your system, this is going to change how you approach this problem. So how do you change your algorithms to address this issue? And over the course of this module, we'll talk about some solutions to this. So some context that we have to deal with here. You know, we don't always know the entire data set in advance. So a lot of the content that we've talked about up till now, we sort of assume that we know the full space of the world. Now, we know that that's not true because we know that there is constantly new social media content being posted, new uh, videos being watched on YouTube or Netflix, new articles uh, written on a particular news site, new uh, products purchased on Amazon, all of that can feed into our recommendation systems. Uh, so how do we deal with this sort of completely stream-based sort of process? Now, one way is to like approach this in batches, which is sort of the way that we've that we've dealt with it up till now. And maybe that's sufficient if we're trying to deal with uh, making new recommendations for movies, uh, but but maybe not. So especially with YouTube, if you are constantly watching videos, and YouTube is going to serve you uh, a next video in its autoplay set. You know, it needs to take into account your previous videos and the previous videos of others. So we don't always know the entire data set in advance. Um, similarly, we, like, query, query logs are un unbounded and constantly, uh, constantly evolving. So we can think of data streams as essentially infinite. Uh, they're continuous. We have new query logs that are constantly being, being created as people engage with the system. Uh, new watch histories as people watch more content on the platform. And as long as the platform exists, Essentially, this continuous data can be unbounded. Uh, but we know also, so if we're looking at, at uh, tweets or social media behavior, that it's not constantly the same amount of content. So these platforms become more popular. If you're looking at social media, the time of day uh, greatly influences the amount of inf information posted to these platforms. So not only is this data infinite, but it's also non-stationary, which means it can change over time as the platform becomes more popular or during you know, high volume times when people are more likely to watch Netflix during prime time uh, than they are during like 10, 10 a.m. in the morning. So we can't necessarily say that a 
particular time frame or a particular time slice uh, from the past month is the same, or is gonna give us the same statistics of a stream as a time, a time slice from, from a platform six years ago. So instead, we have to create a new model that deals with streams, and this is called the stream model. And we deal with this generally by assuming that elements enter into our stream uh, through one or more ports at a rapid rate. We assume that, that the stream is so large that we can't store the entire stream in a reasonable way. So instead, we have to do some processing on the stream to reduce its size or have some sort of summary statistic or do some sampling or extract our insights from it uh, quickly rather than having to store the entire stream over time. And from this non-stationary perspective, it is possible that our behavior from the distant past has no real or should have no real impact on the behavior of our current system. So even if you think about this from a financial standpoint with stock markets, you know, how much impact is the price of a stock from 20 years ago going to have on the price of that stock today compared to the price of that stock yesterday. Almost certainly the autocorrelation factors between today and yesterday are much, much stronger than today and 20 years ago. So given that, we need to understand or, or try and answer the question of how do we make critical calculations about these stream data sets when we don't have enough memory to ca capture everything or our memory is fundamentally limited and the stream itself is unlimited. So this isn't a question of being able to just throw more RAM at the problem. Uh, we actually have a different fundamental construct between limited, finite memory and un unlimited data set. So how do we think about this? Generally we think of a number of, of inputs coming in uh, over time. Maybe we have three different streams here. Uh, each stream has some set of elements or tuples that we want to deal with. We have some stream processing element that has some limited or finite storage uh, for dealing with the current stream. Maybe we have some secondary slower archival storage that we can use to extract you know, summary statistics or uh, some partial statistics over previous or historical data. And we want to be able to answer some queries, maybe some pre-specified or standing queries about these streams using our archival storage and our finite memory. And we, get, we want to get some output from that. Maybe it's the most common uh, item or from the, the firewall example, the average number of bytes per, per IP address, because that might be useful for doing denial of service detection or anomaly detection and how people are engaging with you, you know, who is uh, watching way more Netflix than, than most people, these kinds of questions. Or maybe we want to support ad hoc queries. We don't necessarily know the query beforehand, but we have all the streaming data and we want to make the streaming data available or uh, explorable for new data miners or new, new analysts. So given that model, what are some applications here? Uh, so Google may want to be mining their query streams to understand you know, trends in their queries, which may be particular use, particularly useful for advertising. So as you get closer to a holiday season, perhaps, uh, or closer to an event, maybe Google wants to show you uh, ads that are more relevant to the most frequent queries that are going on in your particular area or going on uh, relevant to some particular event. Maybe we'll talk about more of that in the final module on advertising. Maybe you are uh, an IT administrator and you're trying to monitor packets at a switch to detect attacks or detect denial of service uh, or figure out you know, what is the, what's the optimal set of uh, paths my content should flow through the network. Or if I'm Twitter or Facebook, maybe I'm trying to understand well, what's the most trending topics right now where these platforms want to understand something about how people are behaving right now or over the past couple of minutes or past couple of hours and take action based on that very recent data versus data from days, weeks, or months ago. Maybe you have to deal with sensor networks from Internet of Things devices to understand changes in weather or changes in, in uh, conditions for a particular environment or you're mining click streams to understand whether a particular website is getting more or less traffic than you'd expect, or if it's getting more traffic than you might anticipate, maybe the advertising or the cost of advertising on that page should, should increase as more people are clicking on it. Or maybe you're dealing with telephone call records or SMS and text message information, and you want to uh, charge based on 
how much information or how much traffic is going on between two networks and then being able to predict that value using or predict the, the amount of traffic in the next hour uh, helps you bid out how much money you're willing to spend to send content over these networks or how much money you're willing to spend to spin up a new compute instance in a, in a cloud infrastructure. So there's lots of opportunities or reasons uh, to use or try and process data streams. But there are a lot of problems that come into this. So a common problem that you may encounter is you want to count just the number of distinct elements. Uh, how many different people are you actually using my system right now? How many people are, are watching a video? Or how many different people are trying to engage with a website? Maybe we are trying to have some or get some insight over sliding windows where we only want information about the last uh, few elements of the stream. And as time progresses, the last few elements also moves with that. Maybe you want to find the most frequent elements in a stream. So we're trying to look for trending keywords or trending, uh, trending videos or, or trending topics or items or, or security, security appliances that are being targeted for some kind of, of attack. Or we want to filter data, or we have this infinite stream coming in, but we only want to take action on a certain set of them, or only allow a certain piece of the of or a certain segment of the data to go through, because we have some whitelisted set of, of IP addresses or some white whitelisted set of uh, geolocated spaces that need to access our our services at a particular time, or we want to sample some data from a stream. So if we want to generate statistics on a stream, uh, we can do so with uh, relatively low error by evaluating the, the statistics from a sample and this, if the sample is something that we can keep in memory in a reasonable way. But when we start talking about statistics in streams, we run into problems. Uh, so for instance, say we have some input stream of a number of different uh, numeric elements. So the, tip, the typical equation for calculating the, the average here is you just take the sum of all those elements and divide by the number of elements in that in that stream. But in this particular case, to do that, we need to actually store all the elements. Uh, we need to be able to, you know, compute this running sum, count the number of times that, uh, or the number of elements we have. But when we talk about our streams, remember we said that the number is, or the number of elements is infinite. So we can't necessarily store the entire stream. Maybe we can store the running sum and a count, but even then, you know, that is problematic because if we know that these distributions or the distribution of, of elements from these streams change over time, you know, what is the value of the, of the mean across the entire, uh, the entire regime of the stream when we know that maybe the average, what it, what the average was two years ago doesn't impact what the average is now. So this clearly causes some, some problem. So that's one error or one issue where we uh, will run into problems with, with trying to calculate streams. We'll show another one in a second. But we can tackle at least the averages case by uh, rewriting how we deal with, with means. So say we have some input stream. We assume we know what the current time step is. So now we can evaluate the mean in the same way that we have before, we take the sum of everything that we've seen in our stream so far, and we can divide by the number of time steps we have, where we assume that uh, there's one element per time step. Now we can ask if we see a new element from the stream, how much really does that new element contribute to the overall mean? And we can write that out, so we separate the most recent element out, and we still get this one over t factor, that is our, our normalizing factor, uh, and we have this new element here. So we have this 1 over t uh, times s sub t, where our, that's our new element. So we can do some rewriting here and separate out the stream from the previous time step, the, the previous t minus 1 time steps, rewrite this, and what we end up with is a way to rewrite this equation based on the mean of the stream at the previous time step plus the mean of this, or plus some, some additional factor to account for the new element that we've seen. So now we no longer have to maintain the entire uh, stream to understand what its average is. We only have to remember the mean at the previous time step and what the current time step is. And now we can add in the additional factor for the, most, for the contributions from the most recent element. 
So all we need to know is the new value that we just saw, whatever our time step is, that our value of t, and the last mean that we had a minute ago. So that answers that. Now we can deal with averages and streams. So that's great. But still, this, there isn't always a way to do this, or there isn't, isn't always a way to solve this problem. Say instead of averages, we want to look at the median. So to evaluate the median, we have to sort our stream and then find the middle element. Uh, well, we know that our stream is uh, large, so you know for sorting, we have to store all of the stream. We've already seen that that's problematic. And not, not only do we have to store all the stream, but when we see new elements, we have to store the new elements of that stream into the list in a sorted fashion. So that causes even more problems, not just about the memory aspects of trying to store the whole stream, but now at every time we see a new element, we have to insert that element into its, into its proper location to give you back the median. Clearly, this is going to run into computational issues. Uh, so, and there's no good way to solve this problem unless you're trying to do, uh, unless you are willing to take some uh, or sacrifice some, some precision and deal with sampling because we can do samples, which we'll talk about later. So what are the main takeaways when we're trying to do statistics here? So if you're building statistics or trying to evaluate or count things in these streams, oftentimes you can do so by looking at that windows of things or sliding over the most recent kinds of content or the most recent, recent elements. As long as you're not trying to, to track everything, you can generally solve these problems in an okay way. But you can very easily run through all of your memory or uh, computational power by trying to store everything or evaluate exact statistics or do filtering over many different keys and many different streams. Uh, so in the instance of trying to evaluate averages over every single IP address that your firewall has seen. So oftentimes the way to solve these problems is by estimation. Uh, dealing with samples and then extracting your statistics from these samples. Or dealing with filtering through hashing, or rather using hashing mechanisms where uh, we can deal or work with the probabilistic nature of, of hashing and collisions to get some estimate for a particular statistic without actually having to know the exact value. So for instance, say we want to count the uh, distinct items in a set that's coming in from a stream. Some examples where this is useful Say we want to know how many different words are, are uh, or exist on a particular website, because if you, we, have, we have a large number of unique words or a very low number of unique words, maybe this tells us something about the, these pages being inauthentic or artificial. Maybe we want to know how many different web pages a particular customer requests, or how many different products are sold, or how many different YouTube videos are watched, or how many different uh, tweets are sent, or how many different times a particular account is retweeted or mentioned. Uh, we want to be able to count these distinct kinds of things. So especially say we want to count how many unique mentions a particular set of, of accounts get over time. We want to count these distinct mentions from a stream of tweets. So the real problem here is we may not be able to store all the set of elements that we care about or the set of, el of elements that, that we've seen. So in the Twitter case, uh, it may not be tractable to store the unique usernames of every single person that's been mentioned over a particular period of time uh, on my laptop, or the you know full space of YouTube videos that have been watched or is getting some kind of engagement. So the question then becomes: Can we estimate these counts, these this count of distinct elements, in a reasonable way without introducing additional bias? Uh, and the answer is we can as long as we're willing to accept, accept some error, and we're willing to accept that error as long as we can put a ceiling on the probability of that error being you know, astronomical or that error being so large that it, our uh, answer doesn't make, uh, doesn't make sense or doesn't have value. So let's formalize this a little bit and say we have some stream that has uh, vocabulary of size n, so in different unique elements that we could that we could see, and we want to maintain some count for the number of distinct elements so far. We don't necessarily care about uh, which element has the highest count, 
for matching a particular element to a particular count, but we do want to, to know, well, how many different distinct things have we seen associated with this count? So a naive approach here is to use a hash table where we take every single element that we see, push it through the hash table, and then increment the element in the hash table uh, that that hash maps to. So as we see new keys, say these are users who are uh, mentioning people or IP addresses that are watching videos, etc., or watching a video from a channel or something. So we can take these hashes or we can take these keys, hash them, and then increment the elements in this hash table and make some assumption that the number of different non-zero elements in this hash table uh, represent or is a good estimate for the number of distinct elements that we've seen in a stream. So if we're trying to evaluate how many unique people are retweeting somebody or mentioning someone, uh, we don't really, really care about you know who those people are, but if I mention or I retweet an account you know a million times, every time I do so, my key will always just hash to the same place in this hash table, so we can set that to one, we can increment that value. And this is actually the, the basis for the fledglet martin approach that, that is discussed in the, in the book. So it gives you a way to calculate averages and count up distinct, uh, distinct elements in the stream. So now we have some, some ways to deal with statistics in streams. But say we want to do filtering on streams. So we don't just want to understand something about the you know, summary statistics or counting in the stream. We want to only deal with a certain segment of the stream. So how do we do that? So we set up this problem where we have every element in the stream is, is some set or is some tuple that has a key and a value. And what we want to do is make sure that given some list of keys that we care about, maybe they're users or IP addresses or email addresses, uh, etc., we only want to allow or deal with content from the stream that is relevant to this list of keys S. So the question here is, how do we determine which keys from the stream are in S. Now we can do this with a hash table relatively easily, but suppose that we our list of keys is so large that we can't actually uh, store all of them in a hash table because we're dealing with too many of them. Uh, so maybe they're just we don't have enough enough memory to store every single unique user that we care about or every unique email address that we want to uh, deal with because we're doing you know, spam detection or we are doing we're working on some firewall and we don't want to or we can't store every single IP address that we care about because with IPv6 there are more unique IP addresses than there are grains of sand on, on the earth kind of deal. Uh, how do we deal with this? So uh, as an example, let's, let's deal with email filtering where we have you know, a billion good email addresses that we know are actually legitimate people and aren't spam. Uh, or we have some published subscription system where we have a bunch of news articles and we want to match uh, whether a particular message uh, from an RSS feed matches a particular user's interest before we push that user that uh, article. So we have the full set of articles with the product of all the, all the users that we have. So that's a large, very large space. So one way to deal with this is we're given some set of keys that we want to filter we can create a bit array of some number of bits that we can pre-specify. We initially set all of them to zero, and we choose some hash function that will hash all of our uh, keys or any value into some range between zero and the size of our bit array. So we go to our set of keys that we care about and hash each one of them using our hash function to one of these buckets. So we have enough memory to store this hash table of n buckets for every key that hashes to this bucket, we set the associated bit to one. And now as new elements come in from the stream, we only keep those elements that result in a collision. So we hash the element from the stream, we hash its key. If that key matches a, or ma uh, maps to a uh, bit in our bit array that already has been set to one because there's a key that maps to that, uh, or a key that in our, in our 
set s that maps to that to that element, then we let that element through. So we can visualize this. Say we have some uh, set of keys that we care about. We're going to populate our bit array by mapping every one of those uh, keys through our hash function. And now when a new item comes in, we hash that with the same hash function, check to see if there's a one in that, in that part of the bit array. If there is, we output that element, say there's at least a high likelihood uh, or a high probability rather that that item has a associated key in our filter set. A new item comes in, it maps to a zero element in our bit array, so we drop that element because it's definitely not in our set S, uh, the keys that we care about. Because if it was, the only way it was, that that element could be zero is if no key matched that particular element. So if this item comes in uh, and hashes to an element in the bit array that is zero, it cannot possibly be in our set of, of keys that we care about. So what this means is we have no false negatives because we can make sure that any element that comes in that maps to a zero uh, never could possibly have, have uh, collided with or be represented by a key in our, in our uh, filter set. It's not possible to have a false negative. We do have false positives though because of the possibility of collisions. So if two elements, if an item maps to a, a element in the bit array with a value of one, we actually cannot say for certain that that's because it's the same element as our, or the same key is from our key set. Um, there's some possibility of collisions here. And this is actually the basis for uh, bloom filters, a relatively simple way to do uh, filtering on streams using hashing. So there are two ways that we may sample from a stream. Uh, one is we want to set a fixed proportion on the stream. Uh, say we want to sample 10% of the elements in the stream. Uh, two is we want to maintain a fixed size. So we only want to keep 100 elements from the stream. And at any time, uh, the elements in our stream have an equal probability of being in our 100 element sample. So let's deal with the first one about sampling fixed proportions. Uh, we'll note that as our stream gets bigger, our sample may also get bigger. In this scenario, we have a stream of tuples. We can really only store about one in every 10 queries, or maybe we can only process, we only have enough of bandwidth to process uh, one in every 10 queries. So naively, one way we could do this is generate some, some number or uh, timestamp and take the modulo of that timestamp or take this, this random integer and discard anything that uh, when we mod this down to zero to nine, uh, discard anything that doesn't go to zero. So that only has um, a one in 10 chance. So each element only has a one in 10 chance of getting through. But this leads to problems. Say so you want to evaluate the fraction of repeat queries that are given to a search engine. As you know, many people uh, may search for a lot of diverse things, but there are a set of queries that are going, that are going to be um, recurring. So maybe it's for a particular stock market symbol or for the weather or for a sports team where you know, information about, about that particular query may change over time. Suppose that a particular person or a user of the search engine issues X unique queries one time and a set of queries D twice. So the total unique queries is X plus D with the total number of queries being X plus 2D. So if we are trying to ask about what's the fraction of, of repeat queries, then the answer is D over X plus D because D are the, are, D are the repeat queries. But if we or if we're sampling this fixed proportion and we keep 10% of the queries, so say we attach this uh, zero to nine uh, indicator to each query and we drop queries that are not, or whose indicator value uh, isn't zero, so we, we only end up with 10% of the queries, this runs into problems. And we can say, so the sample will contain, you know, X over 10 of our singleton queries as we expect, but, our estimate for duplicates starts to break down because if we get 2D over 10 of these duplicate, duplicate queries at least one time, but not necessarily twice. So if we look at this and if we run out the math, uh, only D over 100 of the pairs actually show up as duplicates because we have to have that 
D element show up twice, and the only way that shows up twice is if we have the one in 10 chance of seeing it the first time, and another one in 10 chance of seeing it a second time. So of our D duplicates, we actually only ever see 18 over 100 of them one time, even though in the full sample they appear twice. So when we actually try and, and count up this proportion from our sample, rather than getting the D over X plus D fraction that we want, we end up with D over 10X plus 19D, because we actually see fewer elements more than one time. Uh, in order to see these duplicate elements, we have to see, we actually have to sample the duplicates, which becomes problematic when our sampling structure has no, no way to, to know or, or give us information that a particular element actually should have been seen multiple times. So this is uh, bad, it gives us bias in our statistics from our samples. So one way to solve this problem is, rather than dealing with the actual queries, rather than sampling the queries, we can sample a different uh, kind of element. So since we're talking about users who are, who are issuing queries, let's not sample the queries, let's sample the users. So we pick one out of 10 users and say, well, most users behave similarly, and then we can use all of a particular user's search history as the basis for our sample. So to do this, all we have to deal with is creating a hash function that can hash our, a given username uh, into one of 10 buckets. So we only keep you know, one tenth of the users that exist in the data and use all of their samples or all of their search history as our sample. So the main takeaway here is when you're doing this kind of sampling, the key that you sample on can have a huge impact uh, and downstream effects on the accuracy of your, of your estimates and statistics. So consider the case of firewall logs, where if you want to make some estimate or generate statistics uh, across a set of connections, you can do that through sampling. But if you want to do aggregates of connections, you want to understand like groups of connections in some way, then sampling in this fixed, in using just, uh, fixed proportions on the connections starts to break down for the reasons that we just showed. So to solve this problem, rather than sampling on the connections, you can sample on the individual IP address and port keys or something along those lines, where you sample on a key that's different from the thing that you want to aggregate. Uh, and that gives you some insight or better insights or better estimates of these groups. Because there's no guarantee that your samples uh, will give you the appropriate set of, of uh, groupings of these connections. In fact, you're much less likely to get a correct answer for these groups or aggregates. So that's the fixed proportion. Let's now talk about the fixed size samples. So here, as the stream grows, we always maintain a fixed size sample. So given some incoming stream, we want to make sure that our stream is always, uh, our stream sample is always exactly S elements. We don't necessarily know the length of the stream in advance, so we can't uh, generate some proportion. We do know how much memory we have or something. But we want to make sure that each item in our sample is there with some equal probability. We don't want to be biased towards a particular element or a particular key. So one way we can do this, say, say we're looking for a, a stream of or a stream sample of size two, we have some stream at five elements, we want to make sure that each one of these five elements in the stream have a equal probability of being in this set two, uh, this, this sample of size two. Same thing, if we have uh, set of seven elements, we want to make sure that each one of those seven elements is going to end up in our sample or has the same probability of ending up in our sample. Now one way to solve this would be to store every single every single key that we've seen and pick out something at random so we maintain this, this random set, uh, but we actually don't need to do that. There's another solution for this where we can instead look at the first few elements of the stream to get to our, our sample size. So say we have some stream here, we're going to say the sample size is two. Now we observe a new element uh, that comes into the stream, say our C letter here. Uh, we have some number of elements in the stream up to this point, so how many elements have we seen? And now we can say with probability S or, or sample size over the number of, of elements we've seen from the stream in total, we keep this new element. 
and 1 minus s over n uh, is our probability of throwing away this new element. If we've picked the new element, we want to keep this new element, then we take out one of our elements from, this, from our sample and replace it with a new element at, at random and uniformly from however many elements are in our sample. So say we have this current sample, s uh, is equal to 2, uh, so our current sample is a and x. The, we observe this, this new element c, so we have a two-thirds probability of keeping c and a one-third probability of discarding c. So we roll some, some fair die to figure out which thing happens. If we discard c, our current sample of a, uh, of a comma x is still the sample that we keep. If we roll and keep this c values with the two-thirds chance of keeping c, then we can randomly replace one of our elements in our sample, say we replace x with c, and now we have a new sample of a of c. It's actually called reservoir sampling, and you can prove that this reservoir sampling approach gives us a consistent probability of every element from our stream ending up in our sample. All right, so now we've talked about the four different objectives from the streams module. Uh, you should have some idea about why statistics in streams is hard. You should have some idea of being able to, or methods for calculating uh, the average from a stream, as well as some other statistics like mediums from samples or the uh, number of distinct elements in a stream. You have a method for applying filtering to a stream using hashing, and you should be able to describe a couple of methods actually for sampling from a stream. And that'll conclude our streaming module, uh, set us up for dealing with computational advertising in the next chapter. If you have any questions about any of this, uh, feel free to post it to the Module 7 discussion forum.